You might have dreamt of having a large, thriving indoor jungle filled to the brim with houseplants that looks just like those gorgeous photos that maybe you've seen on Pinterest or Instagram. However, there's a lot of work that goes into having a large plant collection. You need to be organized and you need to have systems to ensure that all your plant babies can thrive. Samantha from the insanely popular Instagram account House Plus Plant is no stranger to this as she has been successfully caring for over 200 plant babies for years, in addition to some human babies as well. Today's episode is so fun. Samantha and I talk about large plant collections, her favorite planty tools, her favorite tricks for keeping all of her plants alive, plant styling, and so much more. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. If you're a repeat listener, so happy to be spending this hour with you this week. And if you're a new listener, I'm Maria. I'm the host of the podcast, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life by doing so because plants make us happy, right? I'm in my recording studio with my baby parakeet, Frankie, so you might hear him chirping along. (laughs) He's very excited about this interview with Samantha as well. But I'm so excited about our conversation today because you've probably dreamt of having a large houseplant collection at some point, or you've had a large houseplant collection at some point. Maybe you currently have a large houseplant collection and you're looking for tips and tricks. I've heard, you know, from the community that we're in this interesting point where over the pandemic, a lot of people had a lot of plants. And now all of a sudden, their plant collections might be getting a little bit more stressful for them, right? And this conversation, which ran over an hour because I could have talked to Samantha forever, is just chock full of tips, practical tips for how to have a lot of plants, not make your house look like a hoarder's (laughs) nest, you know, and um, how to have all of your plants thrive and thrive alongside them. The topic of this week's podcast is how to have a large plant collection. But also, I wanted to make sure in case you didn't know, we have recently relaunched our YouTube channel. Growing Joy with Plants on YouTube. And we do custom video content on YouTube now every week. Sometimes the content matches this podcast. So like the philodendron episode a couple weeks back had a matching philodendron video where I actually showed all the different plants that I talked about. But we also have videos on the YouTube channel that aren't necessarily audio conducive. So like we have crafts, like we recently launched a spring uh, flower crown DIY tutorial. We have how to take your plants outside for summer that's aired recently, a spring plant care guide. So if you're enjoying this audio content, and if you watch YouTube, you should go over and type in growing joy with plants or growing joy with Maria and I'll pop up and you should check out the amazing videos we're making for you over there as well. But if you're not into YouTube, that's fine. Just stay subscribed to this podcast and we will bring you free episodes every single week. Speaking of the episodes, this episode is so informative. You will leave this episode with strategies and tactics for styling your houseplant collection, for caring for your houseplant collection. Samantha is my houseplant tool girly. I follow Samantha purely because I love just seeing all of the different tools that she uses for her plant care and, you know, for her plant collection. So I'm sure you'll be inspired to put something in your cart after this conversation. But this is more of like a casual conversation where I'm really talking to Samantha specifically about her collection. I've personally admired her. I know a lot of us have admired her. She has 500,000 followers on Instagram. So a lot of people probably have seen her videos. But if you enjoy this style of conversation, that's like a little bit more casual and just me kind of talking to another plant creator about how they keep their plants alive successfully, let me know. And let me know if you have any other plant creators that you would like me to interview in a style similar to this episode. So Without further ado, this is a lengthy conversation. It was so hard to wrap up with her because we could have talked forever. So here is Samantha from House Plus Plant. Sam, welcome to Growing Joy. After being a follower of yours for a while, I'm so excited to get to meet you. We're still meeting digitally, but it's fun to kind of always put a face to the Instagram account. 
I agree. Yeah, I'm sad we didn't meet up in Florida at TPIE. We tried. I know, we tried. <laughs> I know we kept DMing. Did you love it? Did you have so much fun? It looked like you had so much fun. Yes. I mean, it was just very eye-opening. Like there was so much to see. It was very overwhelming, but it was good. Yeah, I feel like I've been to a couple of industry conferences now and it's mind-blowing to me how much we as the like consumer of the hort industry We do not understand like all of the love and care it takes to get a plant to a plant shop to our home. The breeders, the growers, it's like the Wizard of Oz, like behind the curtain. There's like a whole thing going on that we're completely clueless about. My favorite part was just seeing all the new because there's a lot of new stuff that they're like kind of introducing that hasn't hit the market yet. And that was one of my favorites because then I can kind of show behind the scenes to my followers, like in stories and stuff on Instagram. So That was really fun. And they were able to see basically be on the like tour of the whole place with me. And so it was really cool. But I loved a lot. Yeah. Did anything catch your eye? Like what did you come home? What did you bring home slash what are you pining over? Yes. So I actually brought home a few things. Now I flew. So I couldn't really bring home a lot of the like bigger things I wanted to bring home. But I grabbed Foliage Focus, which is a kind of a, I think it's a really popular fertilizer in Australia. And I know that like Sydney plant guy, he uses it and some other Australian plant people use it. And so they had a booth there because they're opening it. Like, I don't know, I think they're going to have it in the States. I think it's available now, like on Amazon, but it hasn't really made it big here yet or anything, but I was going to try it against Foliage Pro because Foliage Pro is my favorite of all time. And so I'm going to kind of test it out and see which one I like better. And then Prop Drops, which is really cool. Market Botany is, he's a big TikToker. And so he has these little drops called Prop Drops. And you literally just put them in your propagation water and it helps the roots grow. So it's kind of like a liquid root hormone. So I hadn't seen it. I've only ever seen the powder. So I haven't really ever seen a liquid one. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, it's so fun seeing these kind of plant fluencers come out with their own things that are developed out of their own need. I mean, you've had a couple of products as well, right? Yeah. I mean, I did just like a leaf cleaner, like a leaf shine, but it also has some neem in it. So it like will kill any pests that are on there too. And then one of my favorite things, and I wish I had like one to show you, but it is a super cute planter. It's like a cream color and it's kind of like a wash pot shape. So it's just super cute and I love it. And It's based off of my favorite terracotta version, but I made a 3D printed version. So it's a lot lighter to ship and just easier to use and things like that. So I love it. It's so fun seeing the new products getting developed, inspired by us and our needs, like easier to ship or easier to pick up, especially these 3D plastic, recycled plastic pots for the big plants, like for our huge ficus lyratas, for our enormous plants when we don't want a 50 pound terracotta pot that like likely will also break, even though all my plants are in terracotta. I love terracotta, but I do too. I do too. And it's, yeah, I mean, I think terracotta is great, but I do love the lighter options for the reasons you mentioned for sure. So much easier to move them around. Yeah. I followed them for a while and I've been seeing them more often. And like in the last six months, I feel like I've seen them more in plant shops, but the Mossify guys, the guys who have done the moss pole, I think it's so clever that they put that anchor at the bottom of the moss pole so that it doesn't fall over. Cause I made moss poles like in 2018 with like a tomato spike and, you know, my own moss stuff. I, there's a YouTube tutorial for anybody who wants it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. But it's so fun even just to see, you know, there weren't moss poles that you could purchase in 2018, which is why I figured out how to make one. But now, you know, there's all these cool products. And that's why going to some of these conferences is so fun. Are you going to go to any other ones this year? I know that there's like, I think it's IAS, International Aeroid Show. The International Aeroid Show. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been to that one. I would love to go to that one because I think that would be amazing to try out. But I went to Cultivate, which is in Ohio. And that one reminded me a lot of TPIE, maybe slightly smaller, but it was still really fun. And there was a lot of, I mean, the guys like Soul Soils guys were at both of these and I know them well, and that was fun to see them. And it's just fun to see familiar faces every time you go. Yeah, totally. I'll be at Cultivate this year too, if you go back. Oh, you will. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. We have family that lives in Ohio, so it's kind of fun to go out there. Okay, we'll finally get to get together in person for a drink. Yeah, that's what we need to do. We'll plan that. I love it. So 
Okay, you're obviously a very influential, you know, plant fluencer going work in these shows, going to these shows. You know, you've built such an epic plant collection. Can I ask, do you know how large your collection is? Have you counted lately? I mean, I literally, I just say 250 plus because I, the last time I counted, I had 250 and I've definitely bought more than I've gotten rid of. So I think I hover around probably closer to like 275 now because I recently brought home like 10 plants. <laughs> so yeah, from Florida. <laughs> Yeah, literally that and just like locally now. So being in Nebraska, we don't have much in the winter, like a lot of the local shops, except for like the good garden centers, but like our Lowe's, Home Depot, hardware stores where you can find some good finds. They don't get plants during the winter, but then come spring, like now they start to put some out and I'm like, I can't resist. It's like my favorite to find a gem at an Ace Hardware, you know? That's like such a fun, it's like the hunt. The thrill of the hunt is like one of my favorite things. The best. Are you friends with the Leaf Joy people from Proven Winners? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I was out there too. Mm -hmm. They're in Home Depots now, which is always fun too, to see like a Thai constellation at a Home Depot, which is always wild. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm just like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. And then now we're seeing the pink princesses for like on clearance for $5 when during the pandemic, people were spending like $500 on the same plant. It's crazy. I know. So when did you start collecting houseplants? I've had houseplants for over a decade. Like I'm pretty old now. So I've had them for over a decade. I would say I started seriously though, probably in like 20... 17 or so when we moved into this house because it has a built on sunroom. I get it's a sunroom. It's like an all seasons room. The previous owner. Amazing. My dream. Like closed in the deck, but put in like heated floor and windows on three sides. And so at first I was like, this space is dumb because it's right next to my normal living room. Like, what am I going to do with this? Well, then I was like, okay. I'm going to fill it with plants. And so I started doing that and they started to thrive in there because of the light. And so I just started to add more and more. And that's really where it like started to explode. Yeah, you stumbled upon every plant lover's dream. Yeah, basically. I know now any house I go to next has to have a dedicated plant room. I don't think I can do a house where they're scattered everywhere. It's too hard. Yeah, I mean, my husband and I are looking to buy this year. And the first thing I look at is the lawn for my garden. I'm like, is there a sunny spot on the lawn? And is there area for greenhouse? <laughs> I mean, it would be wonderful if we had a sunroom, but if not, I'm like, where's the greenhouse going? So what does your relationship look like with plants before your plant room? You mentioned you've been taking care of plants for a decade. Have you always been good at caring for them? Did you grow up with them in your house? So I would say my grandma, my mom's mom, she always had a huge flower garden that I remember from when I was a kid at her house and then a huge veggie garden too. So I think I've always kind of, I grew up like being out in those gardens a lot. And then my aunt has a ton of house plants, always had. Like she was a crazy plant lady before like it was a thing. Like she's always had more unique varieties, you know? So I would go to her house and be like, whoa, that one's cool. What's that, you know? And then my mom always had some too, but she always jokes that like she doesn't have the green thumb of the family, even though she definitely does. And my followers have seen her plants in her house and she does have a green thumb. So, but- compared to the family, she is like the least. <laughs> and it's just so funny. Because anytime I asked her one time, like in stories, I was doing a story when we were at her house. And I was like, okay, so like, how do you take care of this one? I was like, do you make sure you check the soil before you water? And so she's like, no, I just water on a schedule. And I like preach against doing that. And I'm like, mom, <laughs> like, mom, you're not helping me out. Like she was saying everything opposite of what I usually say to do. My mom calls potting mix dirt. Like she won't yes. call it soil or potting mix. Like she's like, you just put it in the dirt. I think it's so funny because so many people, like women from her generation anyway, have such a green thumb with literally not like without trying. And I don't really know why that is, but I'm just always blown away. But yeah, so I've had plants around me forever. And then when I went to college, my mom sent with me some cuttings of a golden pothos just in a pot with me. And it probably died like five different times between like while I was in college, but I always had it and it like would die back and then grow again and kind of do all that whole song and dance. And I still have it. It's actually one of the plants that is vining all around the sunroom now. It's that same plant. So, and it's actually been in the same soil and pot for more than 15 years. 
and I'm not even exaggerating. Like it's crazy. It's still in the same pot and same soil that she gave it to me in. <laughs> that speaks to the hardiness of the pothos though. I mean, that is truly a fabulous yep. beginner, hard to kill plant for so many people. All right, plant friends. So picture this, your home is filled every nook and cranny brimming with vibrant, healthy plants. No spot is too dark. No corner is too dull. If this is your dream, this is where my friends at Soltech Lighting will help you. They will come in and set you up for success with their luxury grow lights to illuminate your plants and your house in the most stylish and efficient way. I love Soltech. I believe Samantha and I even talk about Soltech on today's episode. They have a grow light for every situation you might dream up, right? So if you naturally are increasing your plant collection, you are likely going to need grow lights at some point because unless you have a house that is basically windows, unless you live in a greenhouse, there's going to be a point where your plants end up needing extra support. And Soltech is an amazing company to get your lighting solutions solved when it comes to plants because all of their grow lights have a full spectrum white grow light full spectrum white light that mimics the sun. It gives your plants exactly what they need to grow happily and healthily. If you're interested in installing a green wall or really big plants, you could look at their Highland track light system. If you want to turn your desk into a verdant creative oasis, you could screw their Vita grow bulb into literally any desk or floor lamp and just turn it on. And all of a sudden that is a grow light. Or you can be like me and hang their aspect pendant lights all over your house. I recently just took a closet in my office. I hung an aspect pendant light in the middle of it and I have turned my closet into this highlight haven. I have like 20 plants in my closet. So some people use their closets for clothes and some people use them for plants. And I'm that person and I use Soltech to help me do that. So this April, this spring, don't just grow plants, make a statement, turn your homes into lush urban jungles with a vibe that screams you use the code bloom one five that's bloom 15 to snag 15% off of soltech.com 15% off these lights are an investment. So 15% off gets you a long way. So that's bloom 15 bloom one five at soltech.com dive into the world of stylish eco friendly plant parenting with soltech. And remember, they have your back, they give you free shipping and have a solid multi-year warranty. That's soltech.com and code BLOOM15 for 15% off. On an episode all about houseplants, we have to talk about the company whose potting mixes I have been pretty much exclusively using for the last five or six years, Espoma Organic. So if you don't know, Espoma is a fourth generation family owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. When you plant up your houseplants, you should be putting them in a really high quality potting mix. It's a massive key for success. I have to tell you, I recently had some plants in a mix that came from the nursery and I left them in the original potting mix to have them acclimate to my house. And I recently had this like late night repotting party because I just had it. The mix was nowhere near as good as Espoma. And I just had to like take all of my plants out of the nursery mix and repop them into a spoma. So I didn't pop them up, but I removed the potting mix and put them in a spoma mix because it just retains moisture better. It's got like the perfect amount of aeration. So I've become very particular to the espoma general potting mix for my house plants. If you have succulents or cacti, you can use the cacti mix. They have specific mixes for African violets, for orchids. They even have a bonsai mix if you like bonsai. If you're feeling fancy, if you want to kind of make a custom mix for aeroids that like a chunkier mix, you can mix their potting mix and their orchid mix. I do that a lot for some of my aeroids. But also if you're not interested in buying two different bags and you just want one bag that you can put all your houseplants in, it's going to be the, the general potting mix. Most of my houseplants are in the general potting mix. And they also have a great indoor fertilizer. It's liquid. You literally just pour it into the cap. That's the measuring thing. You dump it into your watering can and it's organic fertilizer for your plants. I do that once a month. And now as we're moving into spring, I'll probably put the fertilizer in my watering can every week or two weeks when I water my house plants. And if you're growing outdoors, you got to check out Espoma for their seed starting mix, their potting mixes, their garden soils, their composts. If you're putting plants in something, Espoma likely has the something that you need to plant your plants in. <laughs> Not the container, but the, the mix that your plants are going in and the fertilizer. So check them out. And their manufacturing facilities are 100% solar powered and they use bio preferred packaging. So to learn more about all of the different options that Espoma has, you can go to espoma.com to check out their indoor and outdoor products and see where your local Espoma dealers are. 
Or you can click the link in the show notes and be taken to my Amazon storefront for Espoma where I have a curated list of their products that I use all the time. Thank you so much, Espoma, for sponsoring today's episode. It's very forgiving. And I will say, I think one thing that did help me along the way, though, was that I'm kind of a chronic underwater. So it never really got mushy rotted because I wasn't watering it too frequently or anything. But it definitely was neglected and malnourished and all those things. And it stuck with me. So I'm thankful for that. But but yeah, it's just crazy. And it's actually, I was thinking about if I should repot it this spring, but it's hanging and it's in a big macrame thing and it's all the way around the room. It would be a disaster. So I'm kind of afraid to attempt it, but I kind of am like, I don't know that plants need to be repotted really ever. As long as you're taking care of the soil and you're taking care of the nutrients and it almost becomes like a hydroponic plant because what happens is like the soil ends up just going away because the plant uses everything from it, it gets washed out, all that stuff. And you got just like a ball of roots. And so as long as you can keep up with the watering and you're giving it nutrients, really doesn't need anything else. And it's not like I need it to grow bigger. <laughs> it's doing fine. And so I don't know. I think it's, I definitely have um, experimented a lot in my plant journey. And that's one of the experiments that I've realized like, okay, plants, as long as they get the nutrients they need, they don't really need, yeah, and the light, they don't really need a lot more. That's definitely, I feel like Plant Parenthood 2.0. Like I would never advise no, someone just getting right. started to to do that. But I think that does speak to the beauty of having houseplants be a lifelong hobby where you have 250 plants. You are an expert in so many aspects of plant care. And because of that, you know, okay, well, if there's basically no soil in this pot, we've got to up the fertilizer, we've got to up the this, and you know how to tinker and play and then you feel like the mad scientist. And it's also a plant that you get to give a little bit more attention and TLC in a different way. And it doesn't get boring. And it keeps you kind of engaged, which I think sometimes people struggle with once you care for plants for a long time. I certainly went through this about two years ago. You kind of get bored, like you kind of get burned out and bored if you don't keep experimenting and trying new species and trying a new growing medium or doing a different technique, because you're just kind of like, a robot going through the motions. Have you experienced that? Yeah. And I think that's why I do try so many different things. I mean, I feel like I've grown plants in pretty much every single medium out there so far, or I've at least experimented with it, tried it. So I feel like I have a good idea of what I like and what works best for me and my environment. But absolutely, it gets boring if you're just look. And that's kind of why I buy more plants too. I want a new challenge because once you kind of quote unquote, master the plants that you have, or like even the genus you have, like you want to move on to something a little bit more, maybe not even more challenging, but just different. Like if you always, you know, you do great with pothos, maybe you want to try anthurium or you do great with monstera. Maybe you want to try alocasia, you know, and they're different. They just grow different and they have different requirements and different needs. And so I think that's also the beauty of plants is you, you really will never get bored. There's always something new. Yeah. There's always something new. Yeah, always. And I mean, look at just Hoyas alone. Like, are you kidding me? There's new, like five new Hoya species or cultivars that come out every single year. Like it's, it's crazy. There's probably even more than that. I don't even know. But so I think it's, for me, it's definitely, I'm absolutely more of like an activator person. So I like doing and kind of like on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. Like once I feel like to me, I've mastered something. I want to move on to something different. And I love to like learn in that way too. So. Well, cause plants let us be the eternal student, right? Like you and I are grownups now. We don't get to go to school. You do hit a point. I feel like when you've got your job, you've been at your job, you've been with the same circle of friends, you've been kind of in your adult ways. You've got to find ways to stimulate that inner student. You did like a cool propagation of alocasia corms in perlite, I think the other Day. And I was like, wow, I've never tried that before. And I was repotting an alocasia the other day. And I thought back to your video and I was like, maybe I should try this. It was perlite, right? Well, that one was stratum. The most recent one I done was stratum, which is a very, very interesting substrate. It's literally volcanic soil that they roll into little tiny balls, basically. And it's used in aquariums as like for planted aquariums. So it's 
great. It has a lot of nutrients in it, all that stuff, but it does break down easily. So once you get it wet, if you touch it, they just collapse. Like they turn into just actual soil. So I do love it. And I think it works great because it has all those nutrients and it has like the good aeration properties and it retains moisture without, while also letting a lot of airflow to the new developing roots. I think it's great. I still prefer perlite though, only because it doesn't break down. You can reuse it. That's basically like volcanic glass that they puff up. And so I think it's really cool to try all different mediums, especially for propagating, because that's one of the easiest things you can try it on. You already have a plant. You might as well take a little cutting and test some things out. But yeah, I would say perlite's my favorite if we want to go there. (laughs) Has the flavor of your plant collection changed over the years? If you've been in this house, I think you said for 10 years, so you've had this beautifully lit situation for a while. Like, have you pretty much had the same type of plants over the last decade? Or has your collection shifted with different seasons of life? You know, if I have to make everything a plant life parallel? Yeah, it has shifted so much. Because at the beginning, I was literally like, I I might kill these plants. So I'm not going to spend a lot of money, I would go and just get either small beginner plants and just kind of test those out and see how they do like even my giant monstera that I have now. It was just in like an eight inch pot when I got it, you know? So once you see that you can like grow something from small to big, like that's extremely satisfying. And so I still love to buy smaller plants and grow them big, but I also, it's really hard to resist a nice full basket of pothos or anything that you see that's already nice and full, which is great. And, but no, I would say like, you know, I went with my more common plants that you can find pretty much anywhere, you know, Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Home Depot, any of those places. Then I started like, once I felt like, okay, I've seen all those, then I started to get into the rare stuff that you could really only get online or that I could really only get online because of where I live, started ordering those and felt good about those. And then now I feel like I'm kind of going back to not the basics, but more just the nostalgic plants maybe is more what it would be like my, like I recently got like an asparagus fern and that's one that I remember my grandma having all the time. And those types of plants that you're like, okay, she nurtured that type of plant. I want to try that too. And just kind of went back to that because I feel like I've either tried and failed with some of the rare plants. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to do that again because they are so expensive or I've got them and they're thriving. And I'm like, well, I don't really need more, you know? So, but I would say Anthurium is kind of my kick right now and Alocasia because both of those are two that I feel like I personally have not mastered yet. And so I'm really trying my hand at those right now. So I'm having so much fun with Alocasia this year. Yeah, I think it's the year of the Alocasia, honestly. Like I feel like so many people are getting them lately. Yeah, we just did a whole episode and on it in January, but I think alocasia look like little aliens. Like they're like these little aliens with their mm-hmm. crazy like leaves the that are just yes. like looking at yeah. you. And yeah. I feel like they have so much personality. And if you get the care right, they're really vigorous growers. Like, well, one alocasia is not doing very well. And I actually was thinking <laughs> of you as I repotted it because some of the corms had rotted. My ninja isn't doing great. But my alocasia stingray, do you have one of those? I don't. I see them all the time. Well, not all the time, but when I do see them, I'm so tempted. But because I said I wasn't, I hadn't mastered them yet. I really was like, I need to make sure I can handle the ones I have. But I think that will probably be next on my list because it's really cool. I can't believe how hardy it is. I really thought it was going to be a sensitive Sally because of the leaf shape and because I feel like it is more rare. It is putting off... There, I don't have a humidifier next to it. Like it's putting off, I think, 10 new leaves. The other leaves are amazing. There's no wilting. There's no crinkling. My ninja, which I feel like a lot of people care for easily, I'm like, it's like on its last leg. And then my stingray is just thriving. And then I also, the alocasia cuprea is one of my favorite plants ever, the red ruby. That one has shot out. They're really vigorous growers if you like get the lighting correct. Well, and those leaves can get, very big. And you got to keep the spider mites away. I think that's one of the things too that get people and alocasia really quickly is the spider mites. But yeah, I think the light, I think I was surprised by, because of course, when I got more, I did more research and I was kind of surprised by the amount of light they actually need, which is quite a bit. And so I have mine under grow lights, a few of them anyway. 
and having them under there has helped a ton. And so I think that was one thing that I never really thought I was like, oh, they'll be fine just over here. And in reality, they needed a lot more light. So I wonder, and this is just speculation, but all of mine are also under grow lights. And I wonder if they're happier under grow lights too, because there's no drafts, like they're not in the window where you're getting hit with drafts, because I just lost an anthurium to drafts, but the roots are okay. So I'm, I'm in the process of rehabbing it. But that's what I'm finding too. I live in upstate New York, and we have old house drafty windows and you get the cold. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And I think those grow lights put off some warmth too. So I think that that is a good, it's kind of a good and then I keep mine a little bit on the damp side. So if it's getting, if they're warm, you have that evaporation from the soil. And so they're creating their own little humidity sphere, even if you don't have a humidifier around them. And yeah, I think they're just gorgeous. I also love that there's so many different kinds to choose from. Yeah. And so many different colors. Yes. And textures. Like there's so many different textures too. And leaf shape and leaf size and stems and like stem colors too. So cool. Yeah. So freaking cool. Where did you get all your knowledge? Like when you said, you know, you do your research, what does your research process look like for a plant? A lot of my research. So I'm a visual learner for sure. Like I, I have read some like university articles, especially on like pest management and things like that. But most of the stuff I learn is just literally sifting through Reddit forums, hundreds of pages, seeing what has worked for people, what hasn't. Like I literally will go through and search for pictures of an issue that it looks like my plant has and then like read the entire thread. And a lot of times there's no answer. And so then I'm like, okay, I got to do my own like trial and error. But other times it's like super helpful in there because people try things and then they're like, I tried this, this and this. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've tried this, this and this too. And it hasn't worked. And then they're like, and then I tried this and it fixed it. And I'm like, perfect. I'm going to try that too. And sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. But I think I've learned a lot just through that, really. And then just my own experimentation. Like, I think there's really no better way to learn than to just do it because everyone's environment is different too. So I'm always giving more like general advice because obviously this room where I'm at right here is gonna be different from the room you're in right now as far as light goes, temperature, drafts, like you said. So if I have a plant that's growing great in fluval stratum here, yours might not in the same spot because, you know, it's just different. And so, yeah, I think it's just one of those things where you almost, you can take all the advice, take it all in, but you still have to do it yourself at the end of the day to figure it out. Trial and error involves error and that's okay. I think people get so scared about doing it wrong. That's part of the fun. And I feel like you learn your best lessons when you kill plants because the pain of the kill hurts, it kind of forces you to, okay, if I do this again, I've got to do it the right way. I think like dead plants are the greatest teachers ever. I don't know. I feel oddly positive about them. Yeah, no, I do too. I think what it comes down to though, is especially if you bought a rare plant, the money involved, I'm always like, don't buy a rare version of something if you haven't had success with the non-rare version. So like for Monstera, for example, if you haven't like grown a Monstera successfully, then do not get like a tie or an elbow or anything like that. So that's a good point with variegation too, just in general, like whether or not it's rare, like grow the green plant first before you grow the variegation. Cause I got to say, I have thriving monster in my house. I have my first constellation and dealing with the white browning. It's a whole different thing. Like it's not like a different care cause I'm still watering it, but you know, I'm having to tinker with it so much more than my monster, which is fun. But I would feel bad for someone who just brings the Monstera Constellation home, maybe spends a little bit more money on it, and then is struggling with this browning where you wouldn't have that issue with the normal one. That's why it's also important to know the basics of plant growth and plant care before you get anything rare, because you would know that the variegation is a lack of chlorophyll, which means that the plant is going to need on average more sun during the day to get the same amount of energy that its non-variegated counterpart would get. So I think that that's one thing to learn too. And that's why I love to be able to help people with that because I'm like, okay, because it's variegated. And it also depends on the amount of variegation. Like I have an elbow that has not that much variegation or it has more green on the leaves. And then I have another one that's like 
the leaves are 90% white. And then we can go even deeper with the browning, like, you know, keeping that white white by using like silica and things like that. And so you can get really down in the rabbit hole of caring for these plants to help them be the best that they can be. But that is part of the fun as well. It's like really learning exactly like the science of the plants too and how they work and how different elements that they use help them grow and all that stuff. So, yeah. Okay. 250 plants. Also, you have plant babies. You have three. How many kids do you have? And what ages? They're all young, right? I feel like they're not young anymore, but they're 11, 9, 6, and 4. Okay. So you have 150 plus plant babies and four human babies. Mm -hmm. And a dog. (laughs) And a dog and a husband. So And a husband. Yeah. How the heck are you doing all of this? What is your maybe daily, weekly, monthly plant care look like? Yeah. So I think one thing that I have basically had to do out of necessity because I do have four kids and all my kids are very active in sports, extracurricular activities. And, you know, we're a very active family. We love to travel. We love to just be out and about. So I'm not just home all the time with my plants. I'm definitely not a helicopter plant parent is what I would say. I'm very much a laid back plant parent. I also feel like I'm a laid back person parent as well, but I'm a laid back plant parent. I don't repot very often. I probably wait too long to repot things like we kind of mentioned with the 15 year old plant, like in the same pot. And I think that's more out of necessity because I love having all these plants. And so it's mostly like, it's kind of survival of the fittest around here, but I still do my best to get to them every day. So every morning I will, because I work from home and stuff, I'm just home. So I'll get my coffee walk around my plant rooms. I have three now. I have like my sunroom. I have this office up here that I'm in. And then my downstairs office too, that has plants in it. So I'll just kind of walk through, do like a quick sweep and just see if anyone looks wilty or I'm also looking for the fun things like Hoya blooms, new leaves, you know, just kind of spending some time with my plants. And I think this is like essential as a plant parent that you do this because you start to learn just like a parent to a human would be like, you notice little things that might be off and then you can get to those issues sooner versus waiting or not noticing. And then it's too late. So I walk around, I look at everything. Usually I'll kind of water whatever I feel like needs it. I definitely am not a person that waters everything on one day. I'm kind of a floating waterer, like I'll water throughout the week, but it's like maybe one or two plants a day. You're like tuning in with your plants on a daily basis with that routine. And then in that time, and how long is that? 20 minutes? Oh, I mean, if even 20 minutes. Yeah, it takes me like five minutes per room. So so you're not doing one three hour watering a week. You're doing a couple plants a day in your 10 to 20 minutes a morning. Yeah, that feels much more manageable for a large. Yeah, and it's more just part of my daily routine. And obviously, like sometimes we're out of town. And so I'll have to do a little bit bigger watering day before we leave or something. But for my everyday routine, it's very minimal. I always have like a pump sprayer of fertilized water sitting in all the rooms as well. And so I can easily just grab that water what needs it. And then if my big plants need it, I'll just fill up a gallon jug and water those. But it's just calming. Like I I think it can get overwhelming, especially if I'm like, these plants are dying and I don't know why. But for the most part, it's just walking around, enjoying them. I think so much, I think we can get so caught up in the caring for them that we don't even enjoy them anymore. They become more of a hassle. And so that's why I again, out of necessity and just more my personality probably is just super laid back, relaxed, like pests aren't a big deal. We can deal with it. You know, like it's just, I don't know, just enjoy your plants. I feel like a lot of people forget to enjoy them. Yeah. Right. You have a cool like watering thing. That's this like weird spout that looks like it helps you reach. What is that? Yeah. So it's a one gallon. I'm sure they use it more for like outdoor like spraying your lawns for weeds and stuff, but it's just a one gallon pump sprayer, but mine has a telescoping wand. So you can pull it out and like, I can water my plants that are hung up high a lot easier. And so I have like three of those. It's so cool. Is it on Amazon? Yeah. Yep. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them in Home Depot. Actually, I don't know if you can get the ones that extend in Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff, but on Amazon, you can find there's a bunch of different kinds, but I just love them. Yeah. For like plants on higher shelves and stuff. I've been looking at that. What does pest control look like? Do you do the bugs indoors or do you do what I would assume you have a very rigorous plan? 
Yeah. Well, it's actually, I don't feel like it's that rigorous. I don't deal with a whole lot because I do a pretty good job of like, when I bring a new plant in, I do that preventative measure like right away. Like I'll wipe down the leaves and, or like, you know, shower it off. And then I will spray. I've been kind of liking horticultural oil right now. I've gone through, I've tried so many different like pest control methods. And I think it's important to rotate them anyway, so that the pests that you might have in your house don't get used to it. So I've tried a bunch. Um, right now I'm I'm liking horticultural oil because it's a miticide, a fungicide and a pesticide. And it's basically just mineral oil. It's safe to use around pets and people and all that stuff. It doesn't smell, it doesn't stain. So I have a pump sprayer again that is labeled insecticide that I use for just that. And it's a concentrate, the horticultural oil is. You can buy it in a ready to spray, but I use it in a concentrate because I have a lot of plants. And so I put it in that pump sprayer. And if I notice the start of some spider mites or mealybugs or like a fungal issue, then I'll spray everything down. So are you doing preventative? So when you bring the plant home, you're kind of quarantining it, spraying it down. And then as you're doing your month, your daily walks, you're spraying when you see an onset of something, are you doing a quarterly like spray down of everybody or not really? It's more reactionary. Yep, it's reactionary. And I I have found that if, as long as you're treating the plant, I don't even move it away from the others. As long as it's actively being treated, it's more important that it's in the light it needs. So I always say like, that's fine if you want to like quarantine it away from other plants, as long as it's the same amount of light it was getting or better. Like you don't want to put it in like a closet or, you know, in a different room that's getting north light versus south. Like you want to make sure that it's getting as much light as possible so that the plant can be strong because they have their own natural defenses anyway. And so as with like all pests, unless they get out of hand, your plant's going to be able to handle it, you know? So that's why early intervention is key with those and treating it to kind of help your plant out. It's when you don't notice a plant has spider mites for like a year that you're going to start to see a lot of like decline in the plant. So, oh my God, a hundred percent. That happened to me once. It was like a plant in the back that I wasn't paying attention to. And then I'm guilty of it too. Mealy bugs completely took over one. It's yeah. And sometimes at that point, it's just like, it's easier to just get rid of the plant than to try and treat it when it's fully taken over. P.S. You just drank from your Stanley and I also have a Stanley Cheers. Water yourself as you water your plants. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Let's do it again. Yes. <laughs> Cheers again. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you were talking about that's your daily. Do you do any like weekly or monthly maintenance with your plant collection? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like nothing on like a regular basis. I'm very much like I said, I'm an activator. So if I see it, I'm going to do it. I'm not super great at schedules in general <laughs> in anything. And so I'm very much a like, I see that plant looks dusty. Okay, I'm going to clean that one today. Or I do right now on my Instagram page have a uh, spring house plant cleaning checklist. So that's been pretty fun to go through. So I I wrote up that checklist and I shared it with everyone. It's kind of, we're kind of going through it together. And so I have a highlight saved. So anyone just joining can go and go back and watch how I do it. I basically just demonstrate how I would do it. And so that they can follow along and stuff. And I, it's been great. It's been like, you know, dust your fans and things. Yes, clean your windows, wipe down the outside of your pots, wipe off the surfaces your plants are sitting on and clean up all the dead leaves, you know, like just things like that where you're like, okay, it's time to get everything cleaned up. And then I also love doing those things because especially like cleaning off dead leaves or leaves that look sick, because then you'll know, okay, if... I know all of them are gone. So if any more pop up, then I can like intervene. So I like to do that as well. But yeah, I just have really loved doing that checklist. I do feel like taking the yellow brown leaves off is so important just to know if more show up, which I feel like people don't talk about as much as just like taking the leaves off to, you know, so the plant puts its energy elsewhere. But that's actually for the plant parent, something that's really important. Yeah, yeah. And I actually think it's a myth that it like the plant doesn't put any, it's actually taking the energy from that leaf. So, which is like, it's not putting more energy into the leaf. So if a leaf is dying off on its own, like because of old age or whatever, I absolutely leave it until it's brown. Because once it's brown, like the plant has taken everything it needs from it. But 
for the ones that are like diseased or like have a weird looking spot or something, I love to cut those off because then you know if another one pops up on another leaf, okay, I need to treat this because it wasn't like mechanical damage or whatever. It could be fungal or bacterial. You know what I just did this week is I have a Calathea orbifolia that I went to Florida to be with my family for five weeks and I had a plant sitter and my plant sitter was amazing. And, you know, we didn't lose anybody, but I didn't have my humidifier running and my orbifolia was very upset when I got back. And so it just has you know, that that classic crispy browning on the edges. And so this week I repotted it. I put it in a little bit more of a moist soil medium. I put it in a plastic pot in, t- in like a less porous pot. And I actually cut all the browning off the edges of the leaves. So I could see now I also put it under glass. Like I've changed a bunch of stuff, but I got rid of that browning. So I can now track, okay, if it continues to brown, then I know that, you know, the amending that I did didn't really work and I need to still compare. And, you know, I'm comfortable with the fact that I knew this was going to be a learning plant and I wasn't going to just like nail it from day one. So what do you do when you try? Because you mentioned you travel a lot. So do you have a plant sitter? Like, what do you do if you go for because if you have alocasia, if you have some higher maintenance plants, how do you manage that? Yeah. So occasionally, like because we have a pet as well, like we'll have a dog sitter. And so that person will also, it's usually a neighbor or someone we trust. So a lot of times I'll be like, can you FaceTime me and just kind of like take me on a tour of the plants real quick so I can be sure that everything's okay. And then if something does need to be watered or like filled up a reservoir or something, I'll have them do that. But honestly, now, because I got, I got five allocation, the same allocation, five of them to do some tests on and stuff, like take it one out and put it, grow it in water remove the soil of another and grow it in perlite. Like I'm kind of going through that and just trying different growing mediums out for alocasia. But I wanted to buy them all at the same time from the same place. So I felt like they were all pretty equal to begin with. But at the same time, I got all of those. I was like, okay, I need a better plan for watering these because they like to stay consistently damp-ish. But I didn't want to put them all into self-watering planters. So I actually got a, it's solar powered or battery powered, whichever one you want. But it literally just, you have a little stake that you stick in. I stick it in each pot. It has little tubes connected to it. And then it the main tube goes to a reservoir of water that I put my little fungus gnat drops in and my fertilizer in. And it waters them every morning at eight o'clock for me. So, and it has an app so I can like see, you know, I can make it go again if it needs to water them a little bit more or like if it's gonna, it tells me that, I'm pretty sure it tells me the temperature and everything too. So I know if it's hotter in the room, I need to water it like again, maybe in the evening. But I do only because I've like, it's out of necessity. It's like, if I'm going to have all these plants, I need the tech to kind of help me with them. You know, like all my grow lights are on timers that I control with my phone. So if I'm gone, I can have them off if I'm not comfortable with them being on while I'm gone, or I can turn them on if I'm like, okay, it's a cloudy day. So I want to have them turned on because it's extra cloudy or whatever. So we do a lot of that. Okay. So walk me through your smart home, walk me through all of the gadgets. So We talked about the fancy watering can spout thing that I'm totally buying. Grow lights. How many grow lights do you have? Eight and then my greenhouse cabinet. So it has some in there too. But eight individual grow lights in one room. And this is my smaller room. So, and then downstairs, I mean, downstairs in my big sunroom, I think because of all the windows, I only have three, I think. And then in my office, I, it has big south facing bay windows. So I just have one over my Monstera in the corner. and then. I do have another grow pole in there with lights on it and then another greenhouse cabinet down there too with lights. And so I have a lot of grow lights and they're all on either, a lot of them come with their own built-in timer so you can set it for like 12 hours. But if they don't come with their own built-in timer, I'll just buy those smart plugs and use those. So that's really easy. The timer is a total game changer because you're not gonna remember to turn it on and off every day and also for the right interval. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, and I don't want to walk around and do it all. And some plants I'm like, okay, well, if that one's fading, I'm going to set the time to only go for like five hours a day of a grow light instead of 14. And it just kind of depends on the time of year too, how long I have them run. So I'm definitely in my like convenience era as a plant parent. Like I went through my era where I was getting a lot of plant cuttings and I was doing a lot of cutting swaps and, you know, growing from smaller pots. And now I'm kind of just like, I want a big established plant that has already been grown well. So I know it's set up higher. 
like higher chance to do well, because if it's grown well, you know, it's better. And I have most of my plants under grow lights because I'm like, I don't want to worry about a cloudy day. I want my plants to be happy and robust. So I've just like tricked out my home. Absolutely. And when you have more plants, you usually don't have as much window space for them. So you do need to have. Yeah. If you go, I feel like once you go over 40, maybe even 30, you got, you need a house, you need a grow light or two, unless you live in the dreamiest, sunniest home. And I'm so jealous. Yeah. And most people, I always like joke because the home builders, most people don't want a lot of sunlight blazing in because of their air conditioning bill and all that stuff. And so I'm always like, I want floor to ceiling windows and all this stuff. And that's just not what normal people would do. So I'm like, okay. And so any house that we have that we'll look for in the future, I'm like, it has to have big windows and hopefully they're newer. So it doesn't just, you know, let in a bunch of freezing cold air. So I think it's one of those things where I will never not think about the like location of the house or like the location of the windows, like what direction the house sits. Right now, our house, the front of our house faces south and the back faces north, which is okay because I can have a lot of plants in the front of the house. But I would probably prefer like the back of the house to face south. But people don't want that because you have way more windows in the back usually and way like it's a lot hotter coming in there. So I think it's funny to like that that would be like at the top of my house hunting wish list is windows. (laughs) 100%. It's so funny. And the real estate agents look at you like you're crazy. It's hysterical. I'm like, no, I don't care how much I have to pay in heating and cooling. I just need the windows. You're like, give me the light. Along with the gadget conversation, something I really admire about your large plant collection is how it doesn't look cluttered. You're great at styling plants. So do you have any like styling tips, organization tips for people who want to have a large plant collection so that you don't look like a hoarder and you look just like you have this beautiful indoor jungle? I appreciate that you feel like it doesn't look cluttered because if you were to walk by my house at night and you look at my house, three out of the like 10 windows are full of plants. And I think any normal person walking by would be like, Ooh, that person is crazy. <laughs> but I think for me, one of the main things I do is I do all neutral colored planters. And I think that helps a lot with just the eye because then you're just really only seeing the foliage. You're not, your eyes not drawn to a bright colored planter or like, you know, or those kitschy like face planters or a head or, and I'm not against those at all, but when you have a bunch of plants to keep it more streamlined and clean looking, it's better to have, in my opinion, just similar colors of planters that are more muted. And then a big thing for me is different heights, like utilizing height and having plants that are in like on plant stands or I have those big clear shelves in my windows and in one window, I guess. And that's great too, because I can have a lot of plants in that window. Not just on the windowsill. Yeah, exactly. And just grouping them as well. I like to kind of group them, I guess, instead of having them scattered all over. Although I do kind of feel like I have them scattered all over only out of necessity. But if you don't have as many as I do, grouping them is great for multiple reasons. It helps with humidity because when they're kind of grouped together, they can provide humidity for each other. It's easier if you want to use a grow light, you can have one grow light over a grouping. It's easier on the eye because then you're not like, oh, plant there, plant there, plant there. It's like you can see everything in one go. And I just think it's easier to care for them as well because you don't forget one that's on the bookshelf, you know? So I think that that's one big thing is just grouping and then the height differences and then the similar color planters. Yeah. Have you ever done any of the Wally Grow wall pockets? I don't have the wall pockets. Well, I have like the normal Wally Grow planters that are like those plasticky ones that hang up. Yeah, the ecos that go on the wall. Yes, I have those. I have a closet that I have put a grow light in and taken the the doors off of that I keep most of my plants in my office in, which is, it's not very aesthetic. It's more utilitarian than anything else because I'm experimenting with a lot of plants right now. But a way I got even more plants in that closet is I put, you know, the interior is white. And so I put the white eco pockets on the wall. And then I'm just putting four inch pots like I'm not planting them. So in my old house, I planted them up and I had a green wall, but I'm not planting them. But you can just put the four inch pot in the eco and put two to three. And it looks like they're planted, but it's great 
vertical plant storage, you know? Absolutely. I actually think it's better. So the eco, the size I have, like they're good size. Like it's a lot of soil. If you're going to plant up a pot, that's a lot of soil. And so I've actually found that I don't like to buy a, you know, eight inch pot and plant it directly in there because too much soil. So I'll usually wait till it needs to be sized up or buy two of the eight inch and put them in there. And then there's not as much soil. You want to make sure that the roots are at least filling half of that, if not more. And otherwise I've planted a pot directly into there and it rotted because it just, it was too much soil around it. So I leave them in the planters in there, just like you said, you're doing. And I still have a few that are like that. And it works great. I like that you can use it for both purposes. You would never know. Yeah. And it looks great. You wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. Any other tips or are there any other like diehard kind of gadgets that you use on your on a daily or weekly basis that you feel like make it easier to have such a large plant collection? Uh, Definitely the hanging plant drip trays. So they're just like these plastic drip trays that hang on hanging plants and you can just water and it drips into there. They're great. You can get like a pack of five off Amazon. Those are amazing. I love I have a tension rod over this window up here. Not that everyone listening will be able to see that, but it's over here and it's great because you can hang any hanging plant that you get on there. You can use a carabiner and just like clip it on if it's in a macrame hanger or if it comes, you know, on the hook that you buy it with, you can just hang it on there. So even if you're not going to leave it there indefinitely, it's a great spot to just get it in the window for the time being. And it's very low profile. Like it's literally just a wire. You can make it like a curtain of, of hanging plants. Yeah. Yes, you can. And it's just a wire and it like, it's super sturdy. And I love that it's not this big, you know, curtain rod bar or anything. It just blends in. You don't even know it's there. The plants look like they're floating. Yeah, that's so dreamy. I love it. You could do Kokodama on that thing too. That would be even more whimsical. That would be so nice. Could you imagine like 10 Kokodama hanging on that? Oh, that'd be so cool. But then you'd have to, the watering of that would be annoying. I'm like, are you holding the the pot of water up to each kokodama and letting them soak? I, you'd have to just, if they're on a little hook though, that's easy. And you just take them down, set them in your little tub of water. Yeah, but I mean, that would be so pretty. I've recently gotten into kokodama just because I, I think they're so beautiful. And once again, seven years, eight years into this, like what's a new thing I can do? And I love them, but they're on a completely different watering schedule than the rest of my plants. And I've realized that it's easier for me to have everybody in the same medium in the same type of pot. So like everybody's generally making sure that I'm attending to them. And the Kokodama, there's a learning curve for me of like making sure that they get watered because it's just it's totally different, but still really fun. What have been some of your challenges with having a large plant collection? And and what have you learned from those challenges? I think my biggest challenge, I think, is just not liking certain plants anymore. Because I because like I said, I am kind of a I get bored and I want to move on. And then I don't give those plants as much care as they need. And so one of the things on my spring cleaning checklist was donating or selling plants that you just don't pay attention to anymore. Because for a lot of beginners too, would be so excited to get, you know, a pink princess for free, you know, and, and so I do a lot of that. I'll give away a lot of plants for free on Facebook marketplace, or I don't love to ship them. It just, it's more of a hassle and it's not a guarantee they're going to get there okay. But I sell a lot or give away a lot either to friends. I dropped off like an entire box of probably 12 plants to my neighbor. (laughs) And it just feels so freeing knowing that A, they love it. And I'm like, I'm giving these to you. I don't care if you kill them. I don't care if you want to experiment with them. I don't care if you want to pass them on to somebody else. Do whatever you want. I just want them out of my house. And then I come back home and I'm like, oh, it just feels lighter because then I'm like not looking at that plant being like, oh, I really need to do this. But then I just pay attention to my tie instead. Or, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's just nice to be able to let the, and I think for a lot of people, it's hard to let them go because there is sentimental value or like that sentimental, even if you don't love it as much anymore, or you don't care for it as much anymore, you still are like, oh, I remember when I got that, or I bought that when I was with my mom or like, you know, there's always those things that come with it that make you want to hold on to it. But at the end of the day, if it's just kind of weighing on your head instead of like bringing you joy, then I'm like, let's just get rid of it. And if you miss it, you can buy it again. <laughs> if you miss that pink princess, you can buy it again. Exactly. And for a lot cheaper than you probably originally spent. For a lot cheaper. Yes. Yeah. And Like you said earlier, you know, we're doing this to enjoy it. And I feel like sometimes with the overwhelm, with the 
other stuff we get, you know, tied up. Like if you're not enjoying it anymore, you've got to make a change. I mean, I have a whole chapter in my book about the dark side of plant care. And it talks about exactly what you said, like what happens when you, what do you do when you feel guilty? What do you do when you kill a plant? What do you do when you kill a plant? Or do you mourn it? Do you just get over it? Oh, I get over it super fast. And that's one thing that I've kind of taken a little bit of heat from on social media because everyone wants to personify plants. And I'm like, this is not like it's literally a plant. And yes, I get that you put time and energy into it. And I get that it's a living thing. But A, it's not more important than my mental health. It's not more important than my kids. It's not more important than my dog or my family. Like it's just, it really at the end of the day is a plant. And so I think that that's hard for a lot of people to hear, especially from like a plant content creator, because it's like, obviously we do have a job to take care of these plants. But for me, most of the time, if I notice I'm not taking care of a plant, I get rid of it before I kill it. So it's, I like give it away to someone that was willing to spend the time on it. If I do end up killing one because of an experiment or because like, I've also gotten flack for that too, when I do experiments and they're like, why would you cut off the roots of that perfectly healthy plant? And I'm like, cause I spent my own money on it and I wanted to see what would happen. It's called research. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm a grown woman and I can do what I want. <laughs> and I, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, and I get where they're coming from too, though, because A, this is my job. I literally can write off plant purchases. So I think for a lot of people too, it's like when it comes down to like buying a plant, like they might save up like from their paycheck to buy this plant that I just cut the roots off for no reason in their mind. And so that hurts them. And I get that. Uh, But I also just try to ask people to see a different perspective as well, because for me, I want to see what happens and I want to see, like, I want to push the boundaries or push like the limits of the plant to see how far, like what it can do. So I think for me, but back to like, if, what do I do when I actually kill one? I'll just throw it out in my garden. And I'm like it, the soil and everything. I'm like, okay, if you, for some first, it literally, and sometimes something else will start to like, you know, something will pop up and a little bit of the plant will start to grow again. And, you know, you never really know what's going to happen, but I do have an emotional connection to some plants, but even at the end of the day, I can still detach from that. And I'm like, it's going to be okay. So I try to kind of preach that as well to my followers of like, yes, we can get really into this. But I think if you get like tunnel vision on caring for these plants and you get so stressed about it, then like we said, it takes the joy out of it. And it also just isn't great for you. It's not good for your mental health. And it's not good to be stressing about a plant so much. Right. Then why are you doing it? Exactly. It's just like any other stressor in our life. And we all have enough of those already. So, I mean, I'm like, if you don't want to do plants anymore, get rid of your whole collection. That's okay. Because you can always start it again. Like you can always start over. And that's why I'm like, I'm planning on repotting my giant Monstera this spring. And part of me is like, I'm kind of nervous that I'm going to kill it. Like I really am because it's super root bound. And I'm like, oh, what if I just destroy it? And this huge thing I've been growing for like eight years or whatever, probably not that long, maybe like five years, just is gone. And like that one will hurt, but I'll just grow another one. I mean, that's what's kind of cool about plants. And once you have the skills, it's like, man, you can just do it again. Well, I think that's interesting because once you have the skills, like once you have the confidence, you're not that stressed because you're like, well, I probably won't do this again. You know, I've learned my lesson. I probably won't. I mean, my woods are littered with, you know, with all of the remains of my dead plants. But I also think it's kind of poetic because I'm like, well, you're returning to the earth. You're going to decompose. You're going to turn into nutrients. The nutrients are going to feed the soil. They're going to feed the tree roots. Like, it's kind of beautiful. Yeah. Plants have a limited lifespan anyway. It's either sometimes things I do, though, just speed up that process is all. But it's not going to last forever anyway. And we should just get joy from them while we can. Agreed. Preach. I love it. I can't believe we have already talked for 60 minutes. We have not. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It's 58 minutes. I'm like, wait, what? I thought we've been talking for 20 minutes. I know. It's so good. I do want to ask you just like one or two more questions. I'm so impressed that you have four young children and plants. Are your kids involved in your plant care? Do they like your plants? Do you have any tips for, you know, moms with kids and plants? Like, what have you learned in that capacity? Yeah, one of the biggest things that I get asked a lot is like, how do you keep your kids away from your plants? How do you keep your dog away from your plants? How do you keep them from messing with them? And I think 
one thing that's been easy for me is the plants were here before my pet or my kids. And so I basically treat it like a hot stove. I'm like, because some of the plants are not safe. Like I want to be able to have plants that are technically like toxic or, you know, not safe for my pets and kids, but I still want to have them around. So I literally, from the time they were babies and like from the time my dog was young, like I was just on it of like, don't touch that. I was like very stern about it and basically kind of scared them, which maybe isn't the way some people would do it. But I was like, you just, you don't touch them. Like they're just here. Now, as my kids have gotten older and they understand and I'm, they're much more capable of like helping me with the plant chores. And some of them do like the boys. I mean, if I ask them to help, they will, if they're not like wrestling or having their own thing that they're doing, everyone is excited to help me. So if I ask for the help to water this, especially with the pump sprayer, they love using that. If I'm like, okay, you guys can water this. They get so excited, but they're excited for about mm, 10 seconds. And they're like, okay, I'm done. (laughs) So I think they're still a little too little. My oldest is really good at drawing and she just kind of shows me the plant love by like drawing me pictures of plants and then like giving me the picture and it's really really sweet because she knows I love them and she wants to like be together in that way and it's really sweet and they both both my girls have asked for plants of their own in their rooms so we've tried that yeah we've tried that but then again it's like they don't remember to water it or whatever so I usually just do plants I'm like it's okay like and I just let them do it and I'm like it's a fact of life. If you don't water, it's going to die. And they just kind of have to learn that. And I mean, I obviously have plenty of plants to spare when it comes to that stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's been fun. I think a lot of them, every time I come home with a new plant, they're all like, mom, you don't need another one. You have plenty. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. You're right. I don't. That's so funny. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I also think it's kind of not, it must be kind of nice just to have this hobby to yourself, right? I mean, yeah, it is. You know, it must be a nice thing to just rejuvenate you that's private to you that, you know, you're giving so much of your life to your kids, especially at this moment of of time when they're all, you know, under 15. It must be nice to just be able to kind of pour into yourself as you pour into your to your plant collection. It totally is. And I it kind of gives me an excuse to be like, nope, I can't help you with that right now. I'm doing this, you know, and I do obviously help my kids with a lot. But I also love that they can see me be passionate about something other than making them a snack or taking them to practice, which I do all those things anyway. But I have a life outside of them, which I think is important too. just like having social relationships and stuff like that. It's good. But I just think that I was nurturing babies for so long. And now that my youngest is four, I think that's when once my youngest was like one and like not really a baby baby anymore is when everything kind of ramped up as far as like, I created my Instagram account, like, cause I could actually breathe again. Like I wasn't nursing every two hours anymore. I wasn't up every two hours at night anymore. Like I was kind of coming back to myself. And that's when I like start, had the emotional and mental capacity to start the Instagram account and to start all that stuff up. And I just think it's been great. And I think it's been really fun. It has been quite a balance though, especially with the actual content creation side and like running a business, it's hard. It's hard to shut that off to be present with my family. So my husband and I both work from home. And so we've had lots of conversations of like, okay, at four o'clock, because my kids get out of school at four o'clock at four o'clock, we're done, you know, and we're just focusing on family and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's really easy when you work from home or own your own business to want to work literally 24 seven, it's like, you just never really shut it off. And that's a conversation we have to like remind each other of often. So I'm not a mom yet, but that's something I'm looking forward to. I know that motherhood will force me into having better work life boundaries, <laughs> which I feel like when I live in the woods with my husband with nothing else to do, you know, it's a lot easier to let work be, you know, your whole life. Now let's talk about your work for a minute. You've built this epic Instagram. How long have you been doing it? What has this journey looked like? Yeah, I think. 2019-ish, I think is when I started my Instagram account. I really can't remember. But even before that, like on my personal account, I was posting pictures of my plants all the time. And that's when my grandma was like, I want to see pictures of the kids. Can you stop posting pictures of plants on here? You're like, these are your kids. These these are your grandchildren. Right. (laughs) Your new grandchildren. And so I was like, okay, I'll start an Instagram account. And so I started a plant account. And this was before reels were even a thing. And I just was posting pictures, you know, trying to do like the inspirational picture situation. And 
I also started doing questions in my stories because I would reach out to bigger accounts and never hear back, which I understand now having a lot of DMs, I understand how that can get crazy. But I just wanted to be like, my goal was to just be available and to be like, if someone had a question, I would respond, you know, and I still like I dedicate so much of my day to answering DMs. And I mean, it's crazy. My screen time on my phone is nuts. Like, I don't even want to tell people what it is because I'm like, it's crazy. You're also really good in your stories. Like you answer a lot of questions in your stories. I do. And I wish I could do more. I try to do. And even in my, like, even I don't even answer all in the stories, but I will answer them. Like if I get them, I'll answer them in DM too. So like you can choose to either share it to your story or to just reply, reply privately. And so even if I'm not sharing it in my story, because I would have like hundreds of answers in a story in a day. And so even when I, when I get them, I still try to answer it, even if it's not like in a story format. So I really do pride myself on and try really hard to be super responsive, super available. And I think when it comes to content creation and copycats and people coming up with other things that are very similar to yours. And just the only thing that I can control really is my consistency and my responsiveness and my hustle, basically. And so those are the things I try to control. And yeah, I think that that's just kind of my personality too, is I'm like I said, again, I'm an activator, like you message me, I'm going to try and get back to you within a few minutes, you know, so that is where the balance comes in for me with like putting my phone down, because I know that there's always more questions to answer. And I hate knowing that I'm letting some slip through the cracks because I just need that space. Well, I think everything you just said speaks to the community that you've built because you can really tell that you really care and that you actually are trying to answer. When did you know that you were going to like be a full-time plant content creator? Because I know you spoke to that. Like, did you have a moment where you blew up or the first time you went viral or did you have this aha moment where you're like, wait, can I make a business out of this? Yeah, so it really was never... I never, until recently, and I'm talking recently within the past year, I didn't have anything go truly viral. Like I, it was more about just posting consistently and like gaining that following consistently. I would say over the past year or so, I've had more that kind of hit and go viral into like, you know, the millions of views or whatever. But even those, like, I don't always love those because it doesn't always reach my target audience. And so I go viral and I get all these followers, but they're not the followers I want, like it might go viral in a different country. And while that's great, and I can understand that people in other countries love plants as well. Like I want US followers, because like, if I'm promoting any products, it's US products, or if you know, like, as far as like the brand side goes, like they want to see like a US following. And so my goal is never to go viral, to be honest, like it's to share products to share tips, all those things. When I go viral, it's fine. Like, I know it's kind of part of the process, but I'm never making content to go viral, like ever, because I've seen at the beginning, I thought, oh, I need to go viral. I want to grow. Well, now I realize like I went viral in one country that I was like, this is actually detrimental to me. Like, I don't want that. So I actually deleted that reel because so many shares had happened and I didn't want more of the people that it was shared to, to be able to come back to it and find it and follow me. Like, so I literally just deleted it. And so it's a weird balance and the algorithm is crazy and you never really know what's going to like do well or resonate. So I truly just have tried to go back to like being a plant teacher, helping people, answering questions. If I find a cool product I love, like I'm going to share about it. Like if I get a cool brand opportunity, I'm going to do it because I think that it's so fun to be able to do all that stuff for like the business side. But really, it's just the money kind of comes along with people trusting you and then wanting to buy the products that you are loving because you love them. So you have to have that like trust first before you can sell anything. Yeah, that's a very grounded approach because I do think after the pandemic, you and I both have been at this since pre-pandemic, but I think in the pandemic, we saw a lot of plant fluencers. So many popped up. Oh, it's annoying. Like it's not that I, everyone, there's enough room for everyone, which I think is great. And I encourage everyone to do it. But yeah, it's crazy. A hundred percent. But what I was saying is, um, I feel like there's some people who just were like, oh, plants are blowing up on Instagram. I'm going to make a plantstagram and I'm going to just kind of capitalize on this, go viral. And you see that in people's content. And I feel like with you, you see that that's that 
you really are here to serve your audience in a rich way and like develop a relationship. And, you know, as someone who I do that with my podcast, but I haven't been on social media as much. And I feel like you're someone who I really admire for for doing that and really consistently showing up. Now we're at like an hour and 50. I'm like, this is gonna be the longest episode of my year. Where can everyone find you? You know, you're my product girly. I feel like I follow you because I'm like, what is she telling me I need to buy next? Because I think I might have like a shopping addiction. Okay. Like my husband would be like, uh, I don't know if you should be buying all that stuff. But I'm like, you're like, it's for the business. It's a write off. <laughs> I literally, I love to try new things so much and having so many plants. Like we said, we need the gadgets, you know, to help us with them. And I also just like cute things and I like aesthetic things. And I, if you ask anyone that knows me since I've been a kid, like I have like that salesman in my blood. Like if I love something, I'm going to try to get you to buy it too, because I want you to love it as much as I do. Me too. A hundred percent since I was like in high school. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. I would always like, I would always have people ask me like, what lip gloss are you wearing? Whatever. Like, and I would be like this, 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 you need it, you know? I've just always been that person. So I think that side of it actually comes very naturally to me. I'm really never embarrassed to share about anything. I'm really never feeling like a pain. I actually truly am like, no, you guys actually need this because it's great. I don't ever feel like I'm a, like burdening someone by saying that they should buy this product because I actually think it can help them. So I think that's one thing that for me is like, I have to actually truly believe in it and love it to share it. But as far as my page goes, I think I was always trying to make it more I just really loved like the fashion and beauty influencers and all that stuff and lifestyle. And so I think I tried to bring that and makeup. I love makeup influencers. Oh my gosh, love makeup. Yes. And I think I tried to bring that feel to the plant world of like, I mean, I don't want to say I was the first because I don't know if everyone was doing it or not, but I feel like I was one of the first to really start sharing and pushing products like that in that way of like, especially like the comment this word and you'll get this because I saw my fashion and beauty influencers doing that, that I loved. And I was like, this is an amazing way to do it because I always want the products they're using and it's hard to go search through their stuff to find it. I'm like, if they can just send me the exact link, it's great. So I just started doing that after seeing them do it. And it has worked out really well for my followers as well, because they're like, this is awesome. I get it right to my inbox. I don't have to go search through your Amazon storefront or find it in your like to know it or whatever. No more saying link in bio. No one wants to go look through the link in the bio. So I love it. I think it's great. No more link in bio. Yeah, it's so much easier. I feel like for any entrepreneur, I feel like that's a great tip is look at, like for me, I look at comedy podcasts in the podcasting space because they're the biggest comedies. They're the biggest podcasts. And I look what they're doing and I see, oh, in six months, this is going to be available to indie with the different types of advertising and stuff. And I think that's always that's a great piece of advice for no matter what vertical you're in. Look at the biggest people in a different parallel. Like for you, it was makeup for me. It's comedy podcast. And then know that that's what's coming your way. Yeah. And the type of content that's doing well, too. It's like, is it short form? Is it like the little DIY? Is it whatever? It it all can relate in. It's just finding a way to translate it to plants that I've been trying to do. So I think it's been good. A hundred percent. Well, you're nailing it. Where can everyone find you? And yeah, so literally house plus plant on every single platform, YouTube, TikTok. Plus P-L-U-S. Yes, all written out. YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and my website. Yeah, houseplusplant.com. I'm not really on Twitter or X or whatever it is anymore. I don't do that. But yeah, that's it. Everywhere. Everywhere you want to type it in, just Google it out. (laughs) Yeah, but go check Sam out. You're going to find so many products you want. (laughs) My Amazon card is always full from you. Oh my goodness, yes. And hopefully a lot of answers to your plant questions. (laughs) Definitely. But I do questions and stories all the time. So that's one thing that I love is that people can actually ask questions and get answers. So it's a great part of it. Yes, absolutely. No, you're such a wonderful educator, a great teacher. I've loved following you for a while and it's been so fun to get to know you. Yeah, you too. I loved this. It was so fun. Thank you to Samantha. I could have talked to her forever. I had to like force myself to wrap this conversation up. You should totally go check her out at house plus plant plus is spelled out on Instagram. Like I said, she's my product girly. So I follow her because I really like to see how she's styling her plants, like what little hacks she does with her plants watering techniques. I love all of her products. So if you're looking for a plant product girl, you should go give her a follow. And also she's cool. 
And if you're looking for more visual plant education, you should totally go check out YouTube. Just type in Growing Joy with Maria on YouTube in the search bar and I'll pop up. We have so many fun videos. We have a spring equinox meditation for planting new intentions for the spring. We have a DIY spring flower crown tutorial, spring plant care guides, spring plant care checklist, philodendron care guides, alocasia care guides, calathea, everything you want we've got on YouTube and this podcast. So also make sure you're subscribed. And if you like this podcast today, share it with another plant friend who might have enjoyed it. I hope this episode leaves you feeling inspired. Spring is here, plant friends. Dance around, celebrate. We made it through the winter. (laughs) And until next week, I hope you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.